Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone again to another service here at Bible Tabernacle. Um, we were hoping that we would be able to uh, resume uh, holding our indoor services, and Lord willing, we'll uh, start doing that soon. But uh, I just want to wish everyone a, a happy new year, and uh, may the Lord God uh, bless us this coming year. Uh, perhaps the Lord Jesus Christ will return <laughs> and take us all back, and we're always living in anticipation of Christ's return. But we want to uh, pray for some of our uh, saints and, and people that are a part of our ministry, um, those who have become sick and uh, those with some other uh, issues. So uh, check our with our, uh, our prayer list and uh, let's keep uh, many of our, our saints in prayer. And so this morning I'm thinking of my niece, um, Danny Defonso. Uh, she was diagnosed with the coronavirus, so we want to uh, keep her in prayer as well as uh, uh, Mike and uh, my sister Ruthie. Uh, let's pray for the family. And uh, I want to ask a prayer as well for Donna Charles. Uh, her uncle passed away. And so we just want to uh, bring the family before the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to comfort them during this time. And let's uh, open our service with a word of prayer. Almost oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you always for your abundant grace. Lord, in the many ways that you display your loving kindness and your mercy towards us. And Lord, we thank you for keeping your hand upon this church, Lord. Your benevolence, Lord God, your providential care. And Lord, we just uh, bring before you the saints that are a part of our church family. And Lord, I do pray for Danny at this time and that she will recover from the coronavirus. We do pray for others such as Pastor Libby and his family um, regarding their recovery. And Lord, there are others who are ailing that we want to continue to uh, uphold in prayer. We also pray for Donna Charles, as well as Eugene and their their family and the loss of their uncle. And pray, Lord God, that you will comfort them, Lord, and just give them that assurance, Lord God, that can only come from you as our Lord Jesus Christ in comforting Mary and Martha said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And Lord God, we just want to thank you for those comforting words. And Lord God, with that, Lord, we receive all the assurance that we need. We ask that you will bless this time now as we look into your word. And it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, uh, I want to speak with regard to the truth. Truth today is, is under attack. I suppose when I talk about truth, I should define what I mean by that word. There are different definitions that we find in the dictionary when uh, we're talking about what is true. Um, depends on the context. Uh, that which is true, for example, is, is something which is genuine and not counterfeit as in a dollar bill, uh, you have those that uh, can be counterfeited, which, which are not true, uh, which are not the real deal, the genuine article. There's true in terms of that which corresponds to a particular direction, as in true north, for example. And uh, true is also used in the sense of someone who is faithful to others a true friend. Uh, when we think of Jesus' disciples, for example, Judas Iscariot was not a true disciple. But this morning I'm speaking of that which is faithful to fact or in accordance with fact, that which agrees with reality. It's not false or erroneous. And this is what we mean by truth. This is what Jesus meant 
when he said, For this reason I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And we find this in John 18, 37. Paul, too, was faithful to the facts and not speaking falsely when he stated that he was appointed as an apostle when he wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7 that I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. All scripture gives us the truth. The creation of this planet in six days, for example, the account regarding Noah's flood in the book of Genesis, the history of Israel beginning with Abraham, the giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses, the covenant that the Lord God made with King David, and the coming Savior that would emerge from his line, the life of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, the establishment of the, the church, as well as the information that we have regarding heaven and hell and how to spend eternity with God. The Bible delivers the truth. It is factual information. I heard Pastor Vadi Bakum point out that uh, regarding archaeology, that to date there have been some 25,000 archaeological finds which have corroborated the history of the Bible. Every single one of them, not one has contradicted the record of Scripture. 25,000. God's Word, the Bible, is all about the truth. When someone is called to testify, they're asked, to, they're asked under oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The court wants to hear the real story, what actually happened, the facts. And the truth is based on fact. If your version of events doesn't fit the facts, then it's not true. A witness once testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and one of the senators remarked that she told her truth. Her truth? She either recounted accurately and honestly what occurred, or she got it wrong. You tell the truth, or you're mistaken, or simply lying. People seem to be entitled these days to their own truth, not the truth. If it's true for you, then it's true. That, that's the prevailing idea today. It doesn't matter if it's factual. Apparently there's no such thing as lying anymore. Whatever seems to float your boat, so to speak, that is what is true. And that is not the way truth works. I want to read some comments that are taken from uh, Dr. MacArthur's commentary in which he talks about the influence of modern day perspectives on what has led to the uh, perception regarding truth in our world today. The skepticism of the 20th century, he writes, regarding the truth culminated with the rise of postmodernism, a worldview that is still in vogue today, in contrast to the modernists whose rationalistic optimism flowed out of the, of the Enlightenment, which was back in the 1700s, postmodernists reject the notion that ultimate truth is knowable or even exists. Rather, they contend that the truths people believe are merely societal norms created by the culture in which they live. So people basically come up with their own perception regarding truth. Thus, there are no timeless truths, but only ephemeral preferences. That means uh, the word ephemeral refers to that which is brief, just for a short period of time. Whatever works for people is true for them. Pragmatism and relativism reign, reign supreme. So whatever works and whatever uh, 
fits your perception is what is considered to be acceptable. Ironically, the only thing postmodernists are absolutely certain of is that nothing is absolutely certain. As a result, they are forced to defend an illogical position, namely that it is a universal comprehensive truth that there are no universal comprehensive truths. So they are absolutely certain that nothing is absolutely certain. Because postmodernists want to sin freely, primarily it seems in the sexual area, they need to view all truth as culturally determined and argue that no morality or law is supreme. So morality these days is whatever the individual makes of it. You have your own morality. The noblest virtue, therefore, is tolerance of other views. Such is especially true in the area of morals where imposing one's values on someone else is seen as an egregious offense. Again, it's ironic that there was a time where people would often say, well, don't impose your morals on me, but apparently it's okay now to impose your immorality upon others. Others are expected to embrace that or they're wrong. That makes biblical Christianity the most intolerable belief because God does impose his morals upon us. By rejecting the possibility of absolute truth, postmodernism commits eternal suicide by simultaneously rejecting the only path to true freedom, the absolutely universally and exclusive true message of the gospel. Even the contemporary church no longer believes in the gospel as the only way to heaven. This is a survey that was taken by Newsweek uh, 15 years ago. And in that survey, 85% of American Christians, those who claimed to be Christians, believe there are other ways to heaven. And these are people who profess faith in Christ, but claim that he's not the only way to get into heaven. That figure may even be larger than 85% today. And 91% of Roman Catholics agree that there are other ways to heaven besides faith in Christ. Obviously, this postmodern tolerance redefines the gospel and missions in a disastrous way and denigrates doctrine and dogmatism as unloving, thus destroying the foundational truths necessary for salvation. Jesus would be called unloving for making the absolute and dogmatic claim that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The only way to get into heaven is through Jesus Christ. Well, I would like to offer three characteristics of truth for us to consider. And first of all, truth is a very stubborn thing. Truth is very narrow. Two plus two, for example, equals four. It does not equal three, it does not equal five, it does not equal whatever you may want it to equal. It equals four and nothing else. That's absolute. There's no flexibility. There's no tolerance. We can apply this to emails or phone numbers. You have to get all of the characters and all the numbers correct and in the proper sequence. Otherwise, you're not going to make the, the connection. It has to be right. God also, with respect to his character, is holy. He does not tolerate sin at all. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 48, that you shall be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Everything has to line up. We have to be as holy and as perfect as he is. And that's why we need Jesus. We need Jesus because he was perfect. The only perfect human being who ever lived. And it's his righteousness which flowed from his holy nature 
that must be applied to our life when we trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior. Without his righteousness, we're lost. There's no way that we can be as holy as God or as perfect as him. The Greek word for sin that we find in the New Testament is hamartia. And the meaning of that word is missing the mark. And it's a very interesting word. We think of a, a rifleman or an archer aiming at a target. And they have to obviously aim just right to hit that bullseye. Well, because of our sin, we miss the bullseye of God's holiness. We're off the mark. We need the sinless perfection of Jesus to become as holy as God. When Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, launches satellites to other planets, it demands precision. If their calculations are off by even a, a fraction uh, of a, you know, just a, a small amount, just a, a fraction of a degree, the, they can miss their target by millions of miles. They have to be precise. And we find our precision through Christ Jesus. He is the only way to God. We see where the Lord illustrated this point in Matthew chapter 7. And in verse 13, he says that we are to enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by that way. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The King James Version uses the word straight and narrow. And actually the word straight would actually be translated as narrow or should because it refers to that which is narrow or small. But the word narrow refers to that which is very tight. It's difficult or hard to get through. It's, it's a, a tight squeeze. Basically, you have to go on a diet to get through. And it's a spiritual diet that we're talking about, and that is losing your sin. You cannot take any baggage, if you will, through that narrow gate. And that narrow gate is the only way to heaven. The narrow gate represents the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord Jesus even used that as an illustration when he said that I am the gate, the only way to enter the sheepfold. Another characteristic of truth is that truth endures. Truth is a constant. Two plus two, for example, is always four. It always has been. It always will be. It will never change. It's like other realities of life. Fire is hot. Ice is cold. Water is wet. The sky is blue. When engineers build aircraft, they have to incorporate the laws of physics and aerodynamics. They don't change. They haven't changed. They endure. They're constant. And God doesn't change either. What is true of God was true of him before creation. He is holy. His standards of morality have never wavered. They have never changed because they stem from who he is. His holy nature. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, God said, I am the Lord. I do not change. Also in James 1.17, where James in, in writing about God said that he is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And a well-known verse that we find in Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Truth endures. 
And then truth is also universal. It applies to everyone, it applies everywhere. Again, two plus two equals four. That is universal. It applies to all cultures, to all ages of all time, everywhere in the world, and even out of the world. The astronauts of Apollo 13 experienced an explosion on their spacecraft, and then they used the gravity of the moon like a slingshot in order to propel the command module back to Earth. Precise calculations had to be made in order for them to harness the energy and then return safely. The astronauts, they were doing the math on the spacecraft as well as the engineers at the Johnson Space Center. The same mathematical principles applied on the other side of the moon as they did on Earth. Nothing changed. The math was the same. And this principle applies to spiritual things as well. Everyone needs Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior in order to enter heaven. Whether you're someone from the United States or from China, whether Africa or South America, it makes absolutely no difference. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28 when he issued the Great Commission in verse 18 that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and teach or make disciples of all nations. All nations. The gospel is for everyone because there is only one God, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word is all about truth. It's a favorite word of the Apostle John who used truth some 27 times in his gospel and also 21 times in his epistles. Along with John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we also have John 1, 14, where there John refers to Jesus as being full of grace and truth. And then in John 14, verse 17, the Holy Spirit is identified as the spirit of truth. And this is also the case in John 15, 26, and John 16, 13. Jesus in his prayer for us, those who are his saints, in John chapter 17 and verse 17, he testified of his word, saying, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. When Jesus witnessed to the woman at the well in John chapter four and verse 23, he said that we are to worship the Father in spirit and truth. Well, what does that mean? Well, to worship him in, in spirit means that our worship is to be genuine, is to be from the heart. It is something that is internal and not merely external. And truth means that our worship of God must line up with the truth about God. We worship who he is and according to his will and not as we merely see fit. There are those who say that they love to go to the mountains, go out and enjoy nature and that's how they worship God alone. And the reality is that they're worshiping the creature and not the creator who's blessed forever and ever. They're just worshiping nature. That's fine for believers to get out and to spend uh, some time of solitude, if you will, go out into the mountains for some place, read your word, meditate upon that, contemplate upon God himself, spend some time in prayer and even singing praises of, of hymns unto the Lord, spending that time alone. But that does not serve as a substitute for the worship that we find taught in scripture where uh, we are to gather together and to corporately worship the Lord. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, we read in Hebrews, and then Ephesians chapter four lays out for us how we grow together in Christ. So this is essential for believers to engage in as we worship the Lord. 
But we can also see this in the Old Testament law where the Levites were given specific instructions by God on how to carry out their service of worship. And one example was the composition of the incense that was used in the temple. The ingredients given were very exact. They couldn't create their own incense. They couldn't just put together their own mix. And we find this in Exodus chapter 30. Nadab and Abihu, who served as Levitical priests, they were both sons of Aaron, they did just that in Leviticus chapter 10. They violated the word that God had given, and God destroyed them with fire. We see the heavenly hosts who worship around God's throne, calling him holy, holy, holy. There is reverence in the presence of God. We worship in spirit and in truth. Coming to the knowledge of the truth is the path to freedom. Real freedom through Christ. We look here in John chapter 8, where the Lord was speaking to the Jews. And we see in verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, what does this mean by the Jews who believed him? In the previous verse, it says that he spoke these words, that as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Well, the words that he spoke, if we go back to verse 24, he says that I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So it was clear that the Lord was teaching them that he is the Son of God. As we drop down to verse 28, he says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. So when it says that as He spoke these words that they believed in Him, what is it that they believed? Well, they believed that He was the Messiah. However, their thoughts regarding the Messiah was that He would be a political deliverer one who would deliver them from the Romans. But Jesus gets to their real need in verse 31 when he says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And those who abide in God's word are those who truly belong to him. This is not a condition that is set forth for discipleship or for salvation, but rather it is an indication of the fact that we belong to Christ. It serves as evidence or proof that we are his. The Lord spoke along these lines here as well in John 15 and verse 5 when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me... You can do nothing. And so it was those who obeyed the word of Christ and who followed him, who trusted in him, uh, who received true salvation, and those were his disciples, his followers. And then he says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that truth is Jesus Christ himself who embodies the truth. He is the one who is the source of all truth. What is it that he meant by, and the truth shall make you free? This is one of the most misunderstood and misused statements that we find in Scripture. The Jews thought that he was talking about slavery. And in verse 33, they answered, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone which is somewhat ironic, given the fact that throughout their history, they were slaves of Egypt, slaves of Assyria, as well as Babylon, Greece, Syria. And at that time, they were currently under Rome. But they were evidently speaking of the spiritual freedom that the Lord Jesus Christ was getting at because they saw themselves as being Abraham's descendants, meaning that they 
had a, a lock into heaven. They, they belonged to God. They really did not need any salvation or any deliverance beyond that. Jesus may be the Messiah, for example, but we don't need to trust him for our freedom. We already have it. And that was their attitude. But the Lord responded to them by saying in verse 34, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And so they were in slavery, and this was their slavery was sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. A son belongs to the family. He enjoys the rights, the privileges, the inheritance, which comes with being a part of the family, but not the slave. And Jesus makes it clear that although they were Abraham's offspring, they were in slavery to sin. And as a result, they were not a member of God's household. They did not belong to him. The Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 in that episode in which he healed the centurion's servant, spoke to uh, the Jews regarding this very issue in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11, where he says, I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And here he was talking about the Gentiles, people from all over who would become members of God's household and are in, going to enjoy heavenly glory with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. But the sons of the kingdom, who were they? They were the Jews. They were the ones who were the offsprings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They were going to be cast out. They were going to miss out. So ultimately, freedom we see comes through the Son, as Jesus said in verse 36 of John 8. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That is where true freedom is found. Freedom from sin. And freedom comes through the Son of God and not through belonging to Abraham or through anybody else. It doesn't matter what your pedigree is, what your ethnicity, what your social standing. You can't buy your way into heaven. The only way in is through Jesus Christ. And so the freedom that we receive is freedom from sin. And this is what they were slaves to. And as a result, they did not qualify for God's kingdom. How else does the truth make us free? Well, we see some other passages which bring this out as well. For example, in John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And so... Faith in Christ, God's Son, also results in freedom from God's wrath. We experience freedom from God's wrath. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, we see another area of freedom that believers experience, where the Lord says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. We're free from God's coming judgment. In fact, through faith in Christ Jesus, we have passed, or we have crossed over, we have passed that that threshold, if you will. We have crossed that bridge from death unto life. And that is something that we currently have when we know the Lord. And so we are free. That is true freedom. And the last passage that I want to share here refers to freedom from condemnation. And that's found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are free from sin. We are free from the power of Satan. We are free from God's wrath. We are free from judgment. We are free from condemnation. The truth of God is absolutely true and provides us with the only freedom that really matters. The only way of salvation is through faith in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And I pray today that you know and that you have received the truth. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, how we thank you again, Lord, for your word and the absolute truth that we find here. Lord, your word is the foundation of truth. It's like the, the hub of a wheel. And the spokes just go out from that, that hub. And Lord, that's, that's where all truth flows. Your word, Lord God, is, is central. The beginning of the, uh, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We read in the book of Proverbs. And Lord God, I just pray that your truth will be settled in the hearts of each and every one that hears this message. Lord God, for those who have yet to recognize the truth in Christ Jesus, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would just grant them the grace, Lord, to have their eyes open and for them to come to you, Lord, in humble, repentant faith, Lord, to receive that gift of salvation and to be reconciled to God. Lord, this is the truth and the only truth that that matters. And Lord, may we just serve as your faithful ambassadors in this world to deliver that message to a world that is lost. Lord God, because this is what people desperately need today. As your coming is very soon, it's around the corner. But most importantly, Lord, there is a coming judgment that many will face. And Lord God, they need that deliverance that comes from knowing the truth of your word and through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.